Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Christine Dixon of The Ordinary Sacred. And yesterday, in the IFS practitioner consultation group that I facilitate, someone was asking uh, for resources for using IFS with teens. And uh, to me, the, the number one resource is really Pam Krause, who uh, specializes in IFS with children and teens. However, <laughs> in Martha Sweezy's book, Internal Family Systems for Shame and Guilt, she gives a lot of examples of working with uh, teens and young adults that I think are really wonderful. So I wanted to provide this example in particular of Martha working with a teen named Serena, and she calls it Serena and her emotional twin. And you'll see in this example how she uses quite a bit of direct access, talking to the parts that she detects are coming up in Serena. She doesn't force parts language. She constantly makes um, invitations for Serena to make a while you turn and go inside. Um, but Serena often doesn't do that and is really blended with her parts. So it's a, it's a great example. Okay, so uh, Martha says... Serena was a cisgender, heterosexual, Lebanese, Italian, American uh, college student in her freshman year. So she's 18, 18, 19. Uh, she had a tumultuous friendship with another girl and their friendship was breaking up for the third time as they headed off for the summer. I had been seeing Serena for over a year. So she's been seeing her, you know, since she was definitely a a teen, uh, we both knew that she had a very tender, probably pre-verbal exile, but her protectors were absolutely unwilling to let her make contact with it because they feared being overwhelmed, which is a very common fear of our protectors. They need to know that the self really is strong and confident enough to, you know, to tend to those parts that will overwhelm the system before they can back down. So she, uh, meaning Serena, launched this session with compla complaints about her ex-best friend. So this is kind of can be a common uh, issue, friendship issues, right? Um, particular with girls, but also with boys in teenage years. Okay, so Serena's angry part is coming out. She says, she called me a narcissist. She should talk. Right. So she's coming in already blended with this very angry part. And Martha just says, oh, right. Like kind of like, tell me more. And is inviting Serena's angry part to explain. So Serena says, it's me, 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 me all the time with her. Do you like my new shoes? Don't you wish you had this car? Her father buys anything that she wants. And so the Martha says, you know, and what did you feel when she called you a narcissist? So she's inviting her to make a U-turn, right? What did you, what did you feel inside when you were called a narcissist? Um, but Serena's angry part continues. Honestly, if she feels insecure and she needs all of daddy's gifts, it's not my problem. So then Martha says, um, so what did you feel when she called you a narcissist? <laughs> she asks again, right? Because the angry part is not uh, answering. Obviously she feels angry. Um, and Serena says, stabbed in the back. And then Martha says, and then what did you feel? Because that's not um, a, a feeling, right? That's a belief or, you know, this is what she did to me. She stabbed me in the back. And so how did you feel? And then she says, angry. <laughs> so now she's in touch with it. And um, Martha says, well, what does the angry part say to you? Right. So again, the angry part's been talking out and expressing themselves about what the friend has done. But uh, Martha wants to know, what, what does the angry part say to you? Um, Martha says, I know the angry part's blended, but I address Serena's self to see if the angry part will unblend at least a little bit. But the angry part continues. 
she should talk. If I say anything about myself, she starts blah, blah, blah. I have more. I have better. I'm better. So the angry part is not unblending. So the therapist, Martha says, uh, what does the stabbed part feel? Right? Because she said, I feel like I'm being stabbed in the back. So that's a very painful thing, right? This angry part, uh, Mar Martha's intuiting, is protecting a very hurt part. So what does the stabbed part feel? She's trying to, to now differentiate the various parts. And Serena's angry part says, we're supposed to be like friends, same, same. So the angry part is just continuing to explain their story um, and is giving a little more information about why they feel angry. So uh, Martha gets more curious. You were, right? What does that mean? Same, same. The angry part continues. Yes, it's not so easy to make friends in college. My parents are divorced divorced and so are hers we like the same things and we were both lonely i trusted her so the angry part's giving this background of we had all these things in common and i thought that was a bond and now now she's betraying me the therapist says uh martha says when someone you trust hurts you how do you treat yourself Again, Martha is encouraging a, a U-turn from the aim of focusing Serena on her reactive parts and trying to locate her exile, right? So what's going on inside of you when this happens? And Serena says, what do you mean? And Martha says, is it okay to notice that? Like what happens inside of you? Serena says, I get mad at myself. Okay, so now she's going somewhere about what's really happening inside of her. And Martha says, so you have a part who gets mad at you? What does it say? Serena says, it says, I warned you, stupid. And Martha says, so it criticizes you. What else do you notice? Serena says, well, I get mad at the other person, right? I have a part that gets mad at me, and I have a part that gets mad at the other person. So Martha reflects this back. So one part criticizes you and another part gets mad at her. And we've been hearing from that part, right? Serena says, yes. And Martha says, what else do you notice? Serena says, I just end up hating on that person. So she's noticing now. Now she has a little distance. She's noticing the angry part that she was just blended with. She's hating on that person. Uh, so the therapist says, so the angry part keeps the spotlight. And then what happens to the part who's feeling hurt? Serena says, it's just gone, right? This is very common that there's a deflection, right? When we be, our exile begins to feel hurt and pain, the angry part comes out to deflect. It's really in many ways a way of escaping the pain, pushing it out. Um, okay. So she says that the exile is gone and Martha says, well, I bet it's covered up, but it's not gone. If you could help it, could the angry part, would the angry part need to be so angry? Right. So now Martha's self is introducing this idea of possibly helping what the angry part protects. Um, and I just want to mention here, if you watch the last video I did about um, Israel and Gaza, and I was getting in touch with a raging part. As soon as I started listening to it, I immediately started to feel grief and pain underneath it. Uh, and that's a very common experience. When we have raging parts, there is always a vulnerable part underneath that is feeling hurt, pain, grief, sadness, um, all of those kinds of things that the angry part is trying to protect. There was one time when I was trying to get in touch with an angry part. I was feeling really angry at something that someone had done to me. And so I went to the mirror to look at the angry part. And I, it was so interesting. I was like bearing my fangs. So I was like, ah, ah, so angry, tensing my, my face, my jaw, my fist and bearing my fangs. And then I noticed that there were tears in my eyes. I noticed the pain behind it that my exile was also showing up in that, that 
um, the teary eyes. So it's always the the rage is always right on the heels of that exile. Um, okay, so then Serena's angry part comes out again and says, I will never trust her again. Again, this is a very protective part. Uh, the angry part ignores the therapist uh, as being angry seems safer than feeling hurt. So it's not interested in unblending. Again, if the angry part unblends, the pain will come up because that's what's right underneath the surface. And so when someone refuses to unblend from an angry part, it's usually just because it doesn't feel safe, right? For that tender, vulnerable part to come up. So Martha says, I hear you and we can help the hurt part. So Martha's self is persisting in offering help. And Serena's angry part says, it's not my fault. Uh, so now, <laughs> this is interesting. It's as, as a practitioner, you're really deciphering like who each part is talking to right? So when the angry part comes out and says, it's not my fault. It's like, who is she, is that angry part talking to? It's likely talking to the critic, right? The inner critic that Serena said she also has that beats her up, right? Is saying, you did this wrong. You're at fault. And that's, a, there's a polarization there between that critical part and the angry part and the angry part saying, but it's not my fault. It's defending itself. And um, let's see. So the Martha says, so does the other part say it's your fault? Uh, so because the angry part will not unblend, Martha follows suit and goes back to that protector polarity. And Serena's angry part says again, I'm supposed to be the goody goody. I'm supposed to just roll over and just to have friends. I don't want to do it anymore. Okay, so now... She's um, revealing a polarization between maybe a goody goody part, right? A part that wants her to just be good and, you know, do whatever she needs to do, please and appease in order to keep the peace. And those parts are often polarized with angry parts that say no, because angry parts have loyalty to our value, right? No, that's not okay. That doesn't value us. And then they get upset. Um, Martha says, the, so the critical part tells Serena to roll over if she wants friends. Serena nods. She said, would the critical part and the angry part let the Serena who's not a part mediate this disagreement? Okay, so now any part can be critical. So this is not necessarily her inner critic. What it sounds like to me is that the critical part in this instance is her people-pleasing part that is saying, don't get angry. You're going to cause problems. You're going to cause further, I guess, uh, breach in the relationship. You need to please and appease. And so it's, it's critical of the angry part in this instance, but its main role is to make sure that Serena bends over and is the goody goody girl. Um, so, so Martha says, why don't we work with these two parts? So Martha says, rather than speaking to the angry, this is an aside, rather than speaking to the angry part again, I speak about Serena in the third person and I name the polarity. I assert that Serena's self can help. So again, as a practitioner, we are the parts detector and we, we speak for what we notice and we try to encourage the system that the client who is not a part, their self can help, can help the polarization, can help the, the wounded part. We're offering that hope. Um, and Serena's angry part comes out and says, oh, I hate the goody goody, right? She hates this other part, this ple people pleasing part. Um, but again, she's very blended with the angry part. So again, Martha's very patient and persistent. You can tell that she's in self. Um, so the therapist, Martha, just agrees to talk to the angry part and, and ask, does the goody-goody go away when you hate it? Uh, and the angry part says, no. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of that question of like, how is it working for you? Not in a, 
condescending way but in a genuine way like does does it work no um and so then martha says if you can't make it go away what do you think about trying something new with serena's help you two could meet and talk and it wouldn't cost you anything and i bet you would find it interesting so here martha's really trying to be the hope merchant and really trying to sell this experiment you know it wouldn't cost too much what if we just see if this works if serena's self can help you uh, mediate this conflict so martha says i emphasize the minimal risk involved with trying something new and i offer a small carrot right this is often what the self will do because it never steamrolls over a part so it just offers them to try something new a little tiny piece of it and see what happens right let's just see <laughs> serena's angry part is annoyed but says okay and uh, martha says but promise me one thing though and the angry part says what so again it's so wonderful that martha understands this is the angry part that this is not all of serena because if you know, a teenage client or any client comes in and is blended with an angry part, it can feel really overwhelming if you think this is that person, right? If they're speaking to you and they're like, okay, what, right? And they're having that energy. Martha understands this is her part. So she says, if you have any worries or complaints, uh, promise me that you will speak right up. Don't hesitate because we always want to know what you think and feel. So again, the angry part thinks she's going to say something like I demanding, but she's really saying, I care about you. I don't want to steamroll over you. Please tell me anytime there's something wrong. And uh, Serena's part says, that kind of calms down and says, okay, and agrees. Um, so I'll just read the, the very end here. So Serena felt betrayed by her friend. Martha says, I didn't know who had turned on whom first, but I suspected that the process had become mutual at some point. The two young women had bonded due to the mutual empathy and identification of their lonely exiles and their scared protectors. And then their protectors had needed to get some distance from all that sameness, closeness, and vulnerability. So in this interaction, I first tried to get permission to help her exile but the polarized parts who criticized her or her friend, respectively, could only focus on their disagreement. I wondered if Serena's protectors would unblend so that she could be with her exile. When that stalled, I kept the session in flow by sticking with the action and letting my agenda go. This is what we have to do as practitioners all the time, is ask the parts that have agenda just give me space to be with what is, what is here, because we're never going to steamroll over a part to push our agenda. This was more productive. And in the end, her polarized protectors agreed to listen to each other. So when we end up in a session, again, whether it's with a teenager or anyone, and we have this idea of where we want to go, really want to get to the exile, because I know that's going to solve all the problems here. But the parts are just not ready for that, right? The person is very blended. Um, you can see that Martha invited her many times to unblend, to see what was underneath, to take some stock in who was there and what was happening inside of her. But it, it sounds like that angry part in Serena just so badly wanted to be heard. Um, so Martha backed down and began to just really listen. And... Um, and I and, and identify that polarization that was happening and drop her agenda of going to the exile and say, what if we could just work with you um, to create a little bit of relief and peace, you know, in Serena's system. And I also love how Martha points out, you know, how much this this dynamic makes sense that the two girls in many ways trauma bonded, right? That they had these similar exiles and similar protectors. And they got close because of it, but maybe then their systems got nervous that they were too close and too vulnerable with each other. 
And so created these conflicts of difference um, to pull away. But then of course the exiles get really afraid of that and the protectors come out and begin lashing out at them and at each other. And it's just a really painful situation. So um, if you have any questions or um, comments about working with teenagers, if you have any resources you want to suggest there or questions about working with that population or just this um, example in general, go ahead and leave them in the comments below.